Good afternoon. Welcome to Addicted to Real Estate Radio. I'm Phil Falcone with my co-host Jeremy Ricci and Larry Steinhaus here on WWDB 860 AM every Thursday from 3 to 4 o'clock. If you want to ask us a question or you have a real estate need, give us a call 267 988 2000. And today we're going to be talking about questions. The first thing we're going to talk about is the questions that have been e- emailed in. Uh, what's the best thing about being a real estate investor? Second question is we we uh, talked about the question yesterday. We, we didn't, I'm sorry, last uh, week we didn't uh, cover it. And that was I have a private lender willing to help me. Now what? And thirdly, I want to be a real estate investor, but I don't calls at two in the morning. How tough is it to manage these properties? So those are the questions we're going to be going over. And today's focus is what's the best entity for holding real estate? So you can email your questions to a questions at addicted to real estate.com questions at addicted, the number two real estate.com. Well, uh, one way to solve those 2 a.m. Uh, phone calls is to shut your phone off when you're sleeping. <laughs> That's what I do. Let me tell you a little bit about who we are at addicted to real estate. We buy houses. And uh, if you've got a house that you're looking to sell, don't forget to give your new buddies at Addicted to Real Estate a call at 267-988-2000. And if you're a real estate agent or a realtor and you'd like to hang your license at an investor-friendly agency where we focus on bridging the gap between real estate investors and realtors, then we are the guys you want to come talk to. We have three offices. One in Montgomeryville, right on 309, one in Hatboro, and one in Huntington Valley. We also focus a lot of our time and energy on the wonderful business of real estate investing. And we provide educational meetings for real estate investors all over the Philadelphia area. And we have a meeting, a physical meeting that you can come to once a month. Uh, This month, I believe, we're going to be set up on February 17th. We are meeting at 7 p.m. in Warminster, PA. And if you uh, would like to get an invitation, a personal invitation from me to come to our meeting, make sure you go to addictedtorealestate.com and put your name and email address in at addictedtorealestate.com, and I will send you out an invitation to come to all of our meetings. So how's everybody doing today? Great. It's not, it's a, the weather's finally breaking, and we're, we're, we're getting some rain, and we got rid of some of that snow. Oh, I'm so happy. I can actually see my car again. One of my cars was buried in the snow. I said, what a waste of human capital to divert all our efforts into this uh, the snowfall. I mean, obviously, you can't uh, do anything about nature except for when you go indoors. <laughs> so I say I believe in climate control. Change your thermostat. <laughs> well, if you have commercial property uh, like I do, uh, one of the biggest fears is in a big snowfall like this, you could have yourself, uh, you know, 20, 30,000 pounds of snow on top of a flat roof. And one of the things that I uh, I still do is I go up on the roof at uh, my largest property and I shovel out the gutter boxes and I pour cups of salt down the gutters to make sure that the gutters don't freeze because the worst thing that can happen to a roof is the snow begins to melt and, it ha- and the water has nowhere to go because the actual snow and ice block the gutter box. And if you can't drain, you got yourself a huge problem. If it, uh, you could, you know, you could have a roof collapse. So, snow just, is uh, snow is not a landlord's friend. Yeah, just a place to put all the snow was really the issue with this blizzard that, that we had. So, yeah, I know. I've got a couple of properties that last year, when the snow it was either last year or the year before, when it snowed so often that I think all my profit from that property went to snow removal. All right, so you're listening to Addicted to Real Estate Radio. We'll be right back. As a real estate agent, you know that most people buy a house once every seven years. Imagine working with clients that buy seven houses every year. At Addicted to Real Estate, they teach you how to work with investors because they are investors. Located in Montgomeryville, Hatboro, and Huntington Valley, they pay 90% commission. Work at an agency built for investors, buy investors, and finally learn how to invest yourself. Addicted to Real Estate Agency. Call them now, 215-321-SELL. 215-321-SELL. Hi, my name's Phil Falcone. I wrote a book called Addicted to Real Estate, Why I Can't Stop and Why You Should Start. 
And if you'd love to see an investment book written by a Philadelphian about investing in Philadelphia, I'm your man. You can check out my book at addictedtorealestate.com with the number two. I have a free web TV show there. I have free investment forms for real estate investors. And I have my book that you can check out, Addicted to Real Estate, Why I Can't Stop and Why You Should Start. And the website is Addicted to Real Estate with the number two dot com. I'm Phil Falcone from Executech Suites. Do you have a voicemail machine answering your business calls during the day? Oh, please tell me it's not true. I have an answering service for you that only costs $99 a month. We're real humans. That's right. We have live humans answering the phone in the name of your company and patching the calls to you for only $99 a month. And there are no contracts, so you can try it out anytime you like and cancel it whenever you like. Executech Suites, 215 942 I'm Phil Falcone from Executech Suites. I got a question for you. What do you get for $4.95 a month at Executech Suites? You get an office big enough for one person. You get the furniture in that office. You get the telephone on the desk. You get the telephone number. You get the fax number. You get the internet. You get two full-time receptionists to answer the phone in the name of your company and patch the calls to you, whether you're in the office, in your car, or at home sleeping on a couch. You get the conference rooms, you get the mailboxes, you get the printer, the copy, the scanner, you get the janitorial service, the utilities, and free coffee. I know it's hard to believe that you could get all those things for $495 a month, but it's true. 67 Buck Road in Huntington Valley, Executech Suites. Give us a call, 215-942-7701, 215-942-7701. Welcome back to Addicted to Real Estate Radio. This is Jeremy Ricci, and this segment we're going to talk about questions that have been emailed in. So the first question, guys, what's the best thing about being a real estate investor? Obviously, this is a very uh, subjective question. So, uh, Phil, what's the best thing for you? Uh, Well, there's so many wonderful benefits to being a real estate investor. But I'd have to say that uh, the minute I read this question, or even before I finished reading it, I knew exactly what the answer was for me personally, and that is being in control of your own destiny. I've always been a guy who uh, bucks the system, and uh, I would always be, when I was an employee, which seems like a thousand years ago, I was a very effective employee. I was also always the guy in the most amount of trouble (laughs) because I I, I can't help it. I'm an outside-the-box kind of guy, and I always go my own way. And um, in a corporation, that doesn't always work real well. So I knew I was uh, an entrepreneur uh, with every ounce of energy in my body long before I ever finished graduating college. I knew that I was – I used to tell people in college, I used to say, uh, oh, uh, I'm going to start a business. And there were a lot of them were like, well, what the hell are you doing here then, right? You know, But – that's the greatest thing about being a real estate investor is I'm in complete control of my own destiny. I don't need to be anywhere at 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. every day of the week. I can choose to to be where I want to be. I become the sole person responsible for earning income, and it's a responsibility that I that I welcome with open arms. It's a, it's a great great thing to have. You know, it's it's certainly a lot of fun to be a real estate investor. I have to tell you, you know, it's funny. I'm laughing at you when I when you say you don't have to be anywhere. You have to be here every Thursday at three o'clock. <laughs> Besides that, <laughs> but but, um, but yeah, but you're right. So I mean, you know, you know, the words financial freedom come to mind, and, and you know, and, and I always found that an interesting statement. Financial freedom, financial freedom, and financial freedom means different things to different people, and it may mean that you can simply pay your bills. Um, to me, it means that I can go anywhere I want, any any time I want, and I love that. I mean, you know, uh, you know, you guys maybe remember I went to Nicaragua about a month ago, uh, helped build build some churches there for a, for a, for our church group. I'm going on uh, a real estate, actually a real estate investment cruise. It's pretty awesome uh, this month, so I won't be here for the sh- third show of this month, which is kind of neat too. So you can do that, and you can go away. You know, uh, I'm already planning a couple of other vacations. You know, and, and the other thing that's nice is you know. You know, if you do have family members at home, you know, such as children, and they have an event at school, you don't have to call your boss and say, oh, please give me the day off. You just go. And and that's just great for family. Yeah, for, for me, that's uh, that's definitely one of the pluses is being able to uh, take off. I know some of the uh, teachers in my kids' school say, wow, it's nice having a dad here. We rarely get dads come to our classroom to read a book or whatever to help out in the class. Typically, the the, uh, the teachers have me go out in the hallway and, and – uh, 
rip pages out of the workbooks and stuff, and it's not exactly what I what I wanted to do. I'd like to see the kids, you know, interact with them in the class. But uh, but definitely that's spending time with family and having that flexibility to go to a soccer game or a hockey game. In my kids' case, is is a great benefit. And you know, the other thing is uh, the networking with other real estate investors. I just find it to be uh, very enriching is and talking with other people that do what you do and getting some advice from them. I'll be going out to um, to Aspen for a, a real estate investor ski trip where we're going to be on the slopes and then also talk real estate all throughout the week. And, uh, you know, it's neat to be to get some experience from older older guys that have done it a while and have different techniques and, and learning from them. The um, You know, the other thing I would say that, that I really like about being a real estate investor is definitely like you mentioned, Larry. It's just the passive cash flow, having the cash flow come in. Whether you don't have to, you know, most people swap their dollars for hours, and the alternative to that is is uh, building assets and having those assets roll off cash flow instead of having your time roll off cash flow. So when you can build something and have it, and, and businesses are this way too. When you can build something up front and have it give you cash flow over and over and over again, the asset gives you cash flow versus having to go out and you know, earn your next, you know, kill your next prey, you know, <laughs> earn your next, uh, yeah, sure. you know, earn your next check from something that you do with your time versus uh, something you've already done. Yeah, I've actually nicknamed some of my properties, um, my Comcast bill, my mortgage, my car <laughs> payment. Yeah, <sure. laughs> yeah, you know, that's a good way to think of it. If you say, hey, look, I want that nice, new, shiny car, you say, well, how many houses at $200 a month cash flow or $300 Absolutely. a month cash Absolutely. flow yeah. do you need to get there? And you yeah. say, oh, that's only three houses. i got to buy three houses. Mm-hmm. So it's neat. Yeah, you know, what about the excitement of, of building something that could make you filthy, stinking rich? That's something that I uh, am always striving for and love about the real estate business. You know, the only man who uh, never makes a mistake is the man who never does anything. And uh, <clears throat> that's a little quote from Teddy. And... To me, that's what makes this business fun because I'm building something. Every day I'm in it, I'm building uh, a real estate portfolio with each and every acquisition that we, that we try to make. It's like playing Monopoly. And, and, and that's, that's a wonderful goal to have in your life that, you know, as I look down the road, my portfolio gets larger and larger and, and supports my family and so many beautiful things that come from it. So to me, that's, that's really exciting. You know, I actually, I think the third, what was the third question? Something about um, uh, about calls in the, in the morning? Yeah, being a landlord and, uh, you know, a lot of people want to do real estate investing, but they don't want the, the hassle of calls in the middle of the night, plunging toilets, things like that. So, yeah, I wonder if we, we, we couldn't even go on to the other side of uh, what do I hate about being a real estate investor? Maybe we should, should we save that for another time or should we do that now? <laughs> <laughs> Because there isn't much that I hate about it. Cause, always positive. Always positive. I was going to say, that question, that question alone, um, you know, it's funny. You know, Phil said turn off your phone, and it, it, it's true. That's exactly what I do. You know, let's go on to that question now. We'll come back to the private lender one. Yeah, sorry. And like but, you said, turn off your phone. Yeah. It's, a good, it's a good idea. You know, it's funny how, and I think, Phil, you'll agree with this, most problems have a way to iron themselves out if you don't get to them right away. If it's an emergency and they call you and they get you, right. all of a sudden it becomes your emergency. But if it, if you let it go for a little bit, you know sometimes they work it out themselves. Would you would you agree with that? I have uh, been a landlord since 1989. One guy called me. Probably it was was about two o'clock in the morning. And back then I used to keep my cell phone by my bed before I knew about a brain cancer that can come from the <laughs> from the waves of a cell phone. But when I answered the phone, he called me to tell me that. Uh, they had some kind of plumbing leak, and he had to shut off the water, and he wanted me to get – that's water with a W-O-O-D-E-R. <laughs> uh, and he, he said, we have to shut off the water. You need to get a plumber down here right away. And I believe my response to him was, don't you ever freaking call me at <laughs> 2 o'clock in the morning. I said, what are you going to do? You take, you getting ready to take a shower, are you? You know. And I hung up the phone on him. Yeah, even if the water is, even if you shut the water off, each toilet has one more flush left, right? <laughs> right. And, and I had a I had a bad relationship with this guy to begin with, but uh, you know maybe he he was concerned about taking a shower at six o'clock in the morning, and he he actually thought for a minute that having a plumber come out to his house at three o'clock in the morning was some kind of realistic expectation. And also, you know, you had talked in the past about just even managing the properties from Florida. 
you know, people talk about, geez, if I get a call in the middle of the night, I have to get up and go out and plunge some toilets. That's not exactly how it works. How, when you get a call for, let's say, an issue, even if it's a long-distance property. You know? I don't physically go out and take care of property problems anymore. I did when, when I had six properties and I was young and had time and energy and I didn't have money to pay people. But nowadays, it really makes no difference if the property is in Florida or if it's three blocks from my house. I, I'm not going to be the person to go there. So taking the phone call and making sure that I'm organized enough to do something about it right away. Typically what I do is I hang up the phone and I call somebody immediately to ensure that I don't forget about it. Just get somebody out there right away. And that's kind of what we do. So it doesn't really matter if the property was in Belize. Uh, I just pick up the phone and call somebody. So You just might need a Spanish interpreter for that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so that... Larry also, I mean, <laughs> for the properties that Phil and I own, the, uh, you know, Phil takes care of the management. But, Larry, you go a different route. You have properties that are a little bit further away. Yeah, sometimes have I have property managers and sometimes I manage them myself, depending on, depending on where they are exactly. But but even, you know, again, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years. You know, I, I, you know and, and I, I, it's funny. I got, I got one phone call once, and I, I basically told – I think it was 3 o'clock in the morning the phone rang, and there was something about a water heater, uh, you know, had, had, had split open or something. And I, the first question is, did you turn the water up? Yes. Okay, I'll have a plumber there in the morning. Thanks for t- thanks for letting me know. I was a little more sympathetic than Phil was, <laughs> but yeah. but but that was it. I mean, and, and here's the thing, right? So anyone listening, when was the last time you had any living anywhere you had an emergency that you couldn't handle at three o'clock in the morning by yourself? It's very rare that any of these things happen. And with all the properties that I've gone through, having one phone call at three o'clock in the morning ever. Who, the odds of it happening are, are very are slim to none, really. And the only issue that I had with one property was I had a, a property that was right at one street over from my house. And what I didn't like about that property is the tenants knew where I lived. So if they had an issue, they would come over and knock on my door. And I found that, you know, I, I kind of like the idea of having privacy and not having my tenants know where I live. We have, we have a couple office locations, so it's... You know, if they want to come into the office, that's one thing. But having them come over and knock on your door is not something that I find uh, particularly useful. So if you can, has that ever happened? I, I I had a guy come over and knock on my door, yeah. and you know, even if it's something to bring rent, I don't want people bringing rent. I, yeah. You know, I have other people that used to I used to hear other landlords go around and collect rent by hand. That's crazy. No way. That's crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, I yeah. don't have to do yeah. that. So you know, having some privacy for my family, you know, especially having kids and stuff like that. I like the idea of them. You know, if you're just starting out the business, geez, get a PO box, right? Yeah, have I mean, send the rent to a PO yeah. box. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I had the same thing happen to me. I had a had a tenant who had a, had a late rent, and she knew the hundred dollar late payment was coming, and she showed up at my door because I had her sending the rent to my house. Right. I realized what a security risk that was for me, and quickly changed over to a post office box. And I recommend that you get your rent in a post yeah, office. Yeah, if you don't box. have an office, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. If you have a property manager, it's not an issue because they're calling right. the property manager right, exactly. or they're sending the check to them. Yeah. So, all right. So the other question is, uh, I have a private lender willing to help me. Now what? So um, I guess uh, to me, the, the first thing would be get it, find a good deal, you know, find a good deal <laughs> to match up that money with. But as far as um, how to deal with the private investor, it's always good to, to have the right paperwork in place. And we have... Um, We've done some private money seminars in the past. We have some a private money product that we put together that has all the forms that you need, the, the mortgage note, I'm sorry, the mortgage, the promissory note, uh, these private lenders. You want to give them as much security as you can, so you want to give them a, a lien against the property and use a title company that can give them a mortgage insurance policy. So, Jeremy, all these people listening right now, you know, they, they're all going, uh, what are you talking about? So, so you know, maybe, maybe you should explain the difference between a mortgage – and, and a promissory note, and then a, and, and then the actual recording of the note, because I think that would really help sure, people. Yeah. So what? When you people typically say, "Well, I'll go out and get a mortgage," and it's actually a misnomer. What they mean is they'll give a mortgage. The mortgage itself is the lien that's against the house. So the the instrument that's the um, the lien, the collateral that you're giving, is the mortgage. The IOU is the promissory note. That's the promise to pay. So when you when people say I'm getting a mortgage, what they mean is I'm getting a mortgaged loan. The mortgage right. loan, like if you play Monopoly, right? You put your mortgage, you put your, you flip your card over. You have a mortgage against the property. 
And, um, and you can't collect rent, but you can in real life. Yeah, right. <laughs> sure, you can collect rent. <laughs> so, yeah, when you at – the, at the, I guess that you're, they're basically just getting rid of your cash flow, right? <laughs> Once you get a mortgage, right. you're getting rid of your cash flow. Yeah, then maybe that's why they do that monopoly. We, anyway, like, going back, going we, like, <laughs> we like rent that's more than the mortgage payment, right? So uh, so the, the promissory note is the promise to pay. It's the IOU. The the mortgage itself is the lien against the property. You're, you're granting somebody – a uh, encumbrance against your property, and that encumbrance clouds your title. So that if you go to sell the property, that lien has to get taken care of. So, so basically, okay, yeah. So basically, what you're saying is the promissory note ha- explains the details of the loan. So if you borrowed a hundred thousand at five percent interest, it says what your payment's going to be, when the payments are due, if there's a late fee, all of that. But that still doesn't guarantee the person the property. The mortgage is what guarantees the person who lent you the money. The that, property that they have collateral and they can enforce that they can enforce their the promise to pay either against you personally or they can enforce it against the house that you have a lien against so they can foreclose on the mortgage or they can sue you under the note either you know most people go after the collateral because that's where the it's faster the, sure and easier money is and the other thing I would say that we always do is have some criteria as what to keep your private lender safe you know don't borrow more than 70% of the value of the house or 75% or figure out what that comfort level is for you. But I always want my private lenders to know that they have a cushion of equity above and beyond that. Yeah, that's so. a great, great way to convince – I shouldn't say convince, but to help yeah. someone lend and, you money, absolutely. And then the last thing is is provide them with a uh, additional insured on your mortgage, um, your hazard insurance. So if you, there's a fire against the house, the check gets cut to you and them, and that way they know that the funds will be handled appropriately. And then when you say record record the mortgage, uh, you know, recording the recording the deed, the mortgage, how, how do you do that? So recording the mortgage that happens typically a title company is going to do that, and that gets handled at the courthouse, and uh, they're going to take care of it. They're going to march down to the courthouse. That's so the public knows that there's a lien against the house, and that's a pretty simple thing. Title companies take care of that for you. I mean, in closing, I would say about private money. It's one of the most important things that a real estate investor needs to understand needs to know how to go out and talk to people about it, needs to have the paperwork in order to secure it. And if you haven't been doing this, well, then you really need to go to addictedtorealestate.com, put your name and email address in there so you can learn more about it from guys who are doing it. This is Addicted to Real Estate Radio, and we'll be right back. As a real estate agent, you know that most people buy a house once every seven years. Imagine working with clients that buy seven houses every year. At Addicted to Real Estate, they teach you how to work with investors because they are investors. Located in Montgomeryville, Hatboro, and Huntington Valley, they pay 90% commission. Work at an agency built for investors, buy investors, and finally learn how to invest yourself. Addicted to Real Estate Agency. Call them now, 215-321-SELL. 215-321-SELL. Hi, my name's Phil Falcone. I wrote a book called Addicted to Real Estate, Why I Can't Stop and Why You Should Start. And if you'd love to see an investment book written by a Philadelphian about investing in Philadelphia, I'm your man. You can check out my book at addictedtorealestate.com with the number two. I have a free web TV show there. I have free investment forms for real estate investors. And I have my book that you can check out, Addicted to Real Estate, Why I Can't Stop and Why You Should Start. And the website is Addicted to Real Estate with the number 2.com. I'm Phil Falcone from Executech Suites. Do you have a voicemail machine answering your business calls during the day? Oh, please tell me it's not true. I have an answering service for you that only costs $99 a month. We're real humans. That's right. We have live humans answering the phone in the name of your company and patching the calls to you for only $99 a month. And there are no contracts, so you can try it out anytime you like and cancel it whenever you like. Executech Suites, 215-942-7600. I'm Phil Falcone from Executech Suites. I got a question for you. What do you get for $4.95 a month at Executech Suites? You get an office big enough for one person. You get the furniture in that office. You get the telephone on the desk. You get the telephone number. You get the fax number. You get the internet. You get two full time receptionists to answer the phone in the name of your company and patch the calls to you, whether you're in the office, in your car, or at home sleeping on a couch. You get the conference rooms, you get the mailboxes, you get the printer, the copy, the scanner, you get the janitorial service, the utilities, and free coffee. I know it's hard to believe that you could get all those things for $495 a month, but it's true. 67 Buck Road in Huntington Valley, Executech Suites. Give us a call, 215-942-7701, 215-942-7701. 
Welcome back to Addicted to Real Estate Radio. We're going to talk about something right now that is our topic of the day. And a particular topic doesn't get the luxury of being our topic of the day unless it's really worthy of it. Today we're going to talk about something that's incredibly important, and that is what is the best entity for holding real estate? I'm sure that um, if you've been doing some real estate investing, you know, there's lots of options. There's LLCs, there's your personal name, there's S-Corps and C-Corps. But the way that we do it and the way that we advocate all real estate investors buy and hold property is using trust. And our expert on this topic, without question, is Jeremy Ricci. So, Jeremy, tell us a little bit about using trust to hold real estate. So, before we get into the trust and how they integrate with even with LLCs and things like that, you know, obviously we're not attorneys and we're not going to um, advocate that you do something without a consulting with an attorney because everybody's situation is different. Some people, there's benefits to using an S-Corp. Some people, there's benefits to using a C-Corp. And trusts are one of those things that can be used in conjunction with any entity that you form. So um, I'm not going to necessarily give you guys advice on how you should do it, but I'll say how we can do, we do it. And um, you can you know take that with a grain of salt and when you're considering your strategy. We use trusts, and trusts are, for us, number one, the easiest way to – divvy up real estate. If, if uh, let's say Larry and Phil and I are going in on a deal, a trust is a way to hold title that each of us could own a piece of the trust and um, and be able to divvy up the benefits of that piece of real estate and, and split whatever percentages we want to split versus um, uh, doing membership interest in a uh, LLC or shareholders interest, shares of stock in a corporation. And the reason that they are very easy to use in my experience is because you don't have to go through all the red tape. I don't have to apply to the state for permission to create one. I don't have to find out if a name is unique. So if you're starting a corporation or an LLC, you have to typically file a form with the Department of State of your jurisdiction, you know, the state of Pennsylvania, for instance, where we are, or Florida, or whatever state we want to do business in. Some people choose Nevada or Wyoming because there's certain benefits to, to operating in those states. But for us, the easiest way to form an entity is to hit print on the printer. And we have a um, trust that we use. And the first one, you know, took a little bit of um, figuring out. But once it's all figured out, we can just replicate that and do it over and over again. Now, trusts don't give you the liability protection. Uh, they, they may be a first line of defense but they don't give you the liability protection, let's say, like an LLC would give you. So we use them in conjunction. We might make the LLC the owner of our trust, the beneficiary of our trust. Unfortunately, trusts aren't very used very uh, widely in Pennsylvania. We're, in Florida, if you look at the owners of a street, you'll see trusts. Every third house is owned in trust. And, and I think that might be because people that have second homes in Florida, they do estate planning. Um, they, they consult with attorneys as to what's the best way to... to um, hold title to their assets so they can pass them on to the generations. There's a whole benefit of avoiding probate with trusts where you can have your asset passed down to your heirs without having to go through the probate process. You know, the moment you die, it can go to one of your heirs immediately. So uh, that's, and, and the title of the property never has to change. It could be held in the 123 Main Street Trust. And now when you die, your kids own the 123 Main Street Trust that instant, instantly. So it's a great entity. I mean, uh, we have LLCs, you know, Phil, you and I have uh, corporations as well, and uh, there's there's merit to each of those too, but I always use trust as kind of the first line of defense. The other reason that I think is is worth talking about is just the anonymity. The anonymity of trust where somebody can go, anybody with a, a keyboard and a, a monitor these days can go onto Google and search up the owner of record of any property, and they find the owner's name. And they, you know, let's say Larry, they, they pull up Larry Steinhouse, and they say, well, Let's see what Larry Steinhaus owns. And they put your name into a, a search on their public records, and they'll come up with a laundry list of everything you own. Well, with trusts, we name each trust individually. They all have different names, and um, every property is owned in a separate trust. So that really makes makes it more anonymous. So if somebody looks us up, they don't see this laundry list. Yeah, that's absolutely huge. I mean, it's incredibly – it's huge with a capital H to think about it if, if – 
because real estate transactions are, are public knowledge, if you were buying everything in your name, uh, when I first got my real estate license, the we were learning about using trend on public records, and I looked up Allen Iverson, and I could see every house he ever lived in and what the pictures look like inside and what he paid for it and what he sold it for. And it's just fascinating that so much of that information is available out there by using trust. Uh, and because each and every property, if I buy a property at 123 Oak Lane, then Oak Lane Trust will be the owner of that property. And every single property is under a different name. So it makes it very extremely, extremely difficult for anybody to figure out what exactly I own. You know, Jeremy, um, I, I actually, before I met you guys, I was buying all my properties in my name. And, and I actually remember the first seminar I went to uh, that you gave about trust, and it was many years ago, and I loved it. I thought it was amazing, and I was like, wow, why didn't I think of this? Why, why, why am I doing this? You know, I've heard of LLCs, and everybody seems to be buying their properties in LLCs. And, you know, and, and I spoke to you afterwards, and I said, you know, Jeremy, really – you know how difficult is this? And it was funny because you know I, I think I think it was at the time you guys just came out. You guys had a product. Of, you still have the product, the buyer's briefcase, and there's a, the trust documents that you can you actually sell the discs inside the, the inside the, the buyer briefcase. Which which you know after we talked about it, I took a look at that product. I thought it was awesome. And and the trust product that you had in there, the actual document was so simple. And it's funny because, you know, the first time I – well, I shouldn't say the first time. I, I bought several houses in trust. But it was the first time I bought a property uh, in a different – in a not different state, different county that hadn't seen that. And I usually use the same title company, and they had already seen these trust documents. But I went to buy a property in trust. In, actually, it was in eastern Pennsylvania. And the title company out there that I used was a different title company. And the guy sent it back to me and said, this is the best trust document he's ever seen. No, no joke. Those were his exact words. It was and very thought, simple. It's not, you know, when, when he says best, I don't know what. I, on what I, I don't know what I don't, it, I don't know what, he, what he's been thing. used before, but uh, but it was but it was that good. And, and I'm not saying I'm not saying that because you guys are geniuses and you are, but because he really did say that to me, and I thought that was amazing. And it's funny because you know I love it because whenever I buy a property, you know I put it you know again the you know, name of the property trust you know one two three Main Street Trust like like you're saying Phil or whatever the name of the property is, and I can create the trust document in literally five seconds. All right. Takes me about a minute. Phil always holds me on my time statements, but it literally takes me a minute to yeah, create. Fill, the, fill out the blanks and hit yeah. print on the printer. Sign it as a as a beneficiary, or have whoever you want be the trustee. Whether it's you yourself as a trustee, or it should be somebody you trust. Hence the name. <laughs> right, right. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's really that easy. And the other thing that that makes it um, less complicated, I would say, than LLC is you don't need a tax ID number. We're using revocable trusts, so we're not. Uh, we're not using a separate tax ID for a trust. It flows through to your personal return, or if you have the LLC own the trust, as we do, it flows through to the LLC's tax return. So you don't have to worry about, you know, let's say you formed an LLC for every single property you bought as a separate that's LLC. If you did that, that's really yeah, expensive. How, how many yeah. tax returns are you going to have to pay somebody to complete for you? I mean, even if you do them yourself, you have to file with the state. You have to pay $100 plus all the, you know, the... Um, all the recurring fees that go along with maintaining these corporations or, or LLCs. And you avoid all of that by using trust. And it's a very simple mechanism. I mean, to put it in the simplest form, if you've ever given a babysitter money to take your kids, you know, to take your kids out while you were away, you, you, that you've used the trusts essentially. You say, Hey, babysitter, I'm entrusting you with this $40. Use it on my kids for their benefit. The kids are the beneficiaries. It doesn't mean it's her money, right? <laughs> yeah, his right, money. right sure. you're, you're, you're entrusting your money with this. It's for the benefit of a third party, your kids. And, um, and you know, when she's done with the trust, she gives the money back, whatever she didn't use on candy and movie tickets or whatever it may be. I should have gave – if it's for movie tickets, I should have gave her 60, right? <laughs> so so it's, it's a very simple mechanism. And, yeah, we do have a, a product, a trust product. It's a package that we have that goes into uh, how trusts are created. They actually – there's only four or five states in the United States that actually have statute, trust law, on the books. Florida is one of them. Virginia is probably the closest to us, the other commonwealth. And Pennsylvania doesn't have a trust statute, a title-holding trust statute. Land trust is what they're commonly referred to. But because it's the, the state is silent on the use of them, it goes back to English common law. This country was founded on English common law. 
Common law is, is all the, that series of decisions that were made over the years by all the courts. And English common law, I mean, King Henry VIII, you know, was, was uh, one of the, the foundations of when trusts were used um, in order to preserve people's rights under, under land ownership. So, uh, you know, when you, when you want to learn more about trust, look up King Henry VIII. <laughs> no. Well, no, let's, let's great, talk about yeah. some uh, more recent uh, <laughs> issues with trust. One of them would be that in, in, let's talk about Philadelphia and how the trust can help you here specifically. One of the things that Philadelphia does is if you own a bunch of properties in an LLC, let's say you own five properties in an LLC, and you get a fine against one of your properties, just one of your properties. Maybe your tenants are leaving all kinds of trash out on the wrong evenings, and the city of Philadelphia comes down and sticks a $1,000 uh, trash fine against your property after they've been – maybe they're giving you 10 fines at $100 a piece. And your tenant is taking this fine, which is the trash fine, and they're throwing it in the trash. You, as the owner, will never know about it. So you go to sell a completely different property other than the one that has the trash fine against it, and at settlement, without any notification, the city of Philadelphia will uh, put a redundant lien on all properties owned by that particular LLC. And this has happened to me before. It is furious. It made me nuts. It was a, a tenant who didn't pay their gas bill. This was before uh, PGW had the the so-called landlord cooperation rule. Uh, before that, uh, they would just – if the tenant didn't pay the gas bill, then they just leaned the landlords and charged it. Even if it wasn't the same property, it used to make me crazy. So it would essentially be a judgment against the entity that held title to the property. And if – that entity owned other property, it would affect any property that you had to deal with. And therefore, when you go to a settlement, this, they look up the entity, they find out there's a judgment against it and say, you can't give clear title against property in South Philly until you clear up this uh, lien you have in Northeast Philly, for instance. Exactly. So now, uh, like, now, the trust isn't going gonna, isn't gonna to make that lien go away. But one thing it would do is it would give me the option to say, hmm, it's only recorded against that one property. Well, uh, maybe I'll just keep that property forever. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, it doesn't or, or inhibit, abandon it. <laughs> well, no, no, no. no. <laughs> it, it doesn't inhibit least... another. It doesn't inhibit you selling one property and having to deal with an issue against a property that's totally unrelated. So it, it, it kind of segregates each property to itself and and, and self contains that. So. My, my favorite is the fact that no one can know, no one knows you own the property. So I mean, I, I tell people all the time, you know, how many properties? Well, they ask me how many properties do you own, and I always say zero. But I collect a lot of rent and I pay a lot of mortgages. Sure, yeah. Yeah, you don't own the property. You're a beneficial owner. So you own the beneficial interest in a trust, and the trustee owns the property right. for your benefit or for your company's well, people benefit. People ask you that question all the time. They go, how many properties do you own or, or that kind of stuff? And, you know, it's like me going up to a guy who's a stockbroker and going, hey, how much money do you have? <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, it's really not. It's, it, it's like a woman asking her yeah. age, you know, so and, rude. Right, yeah. Uh, and people are always saying, like, well, how many properties do you have? I said, I can't even answer that question because I have properties that cost $50,000. I have properties that cost millions of dollars. How would telling you how many properties I have make any sense anyway? It you know, wouldn't mean anything to you. So it's I, just. I had a friend that said, are you trying to guess my net – you're asking me for my net worth or you're asking me for my ability to manage tenants? Which one are you looking for here? Right. <laughs> how many doors – how many tenants do I manage? You know, so, yeah, it's it's more doors than properties usually sure. too, right? A lot more doors than properties. Yeah, so if yeah. you want to check out our trust, uh, more information on our trust, we've actually recorded – we've had some, several seminars, Saturday workshops that we've done on trust, and we've recorded those videos. And we do have a trust product available. It's on our website, addictedrealestate.com. You can check that out. If you put your name and email address in, shoot us an email at Addicted to Real Estate, and we will um, we can get you more information on the trust product. And I think it's used in conjunction with an LLC or a corporation, and it's it's a great tool for you to hold title to properties, keep each of the properties somewhat segregated, and and um, you know it's a first line of defense. If a Phil, I mean, talk about what happens when if somebody's gonna let's say there's like a slip and fall situation or an alleged slip and fall situation. What, what what happens there? All right, well, basically, uh, let's just say, for example, that somebody had uh, uh, bad intentions and they were, you know, out to do a frivolous lawsuit, and uh, they slipped on some ice on the sidewalk, 
they might, uh, they might show up in an attorney's office in this hypothetical scenario, and they might say, I fell in front of 123 Oak Lane. And the attorney, uh, as soon as the attorney looks up public records and finds out that the property is owned in a trust, he now knows that it's going to be quite a bit more work for him to uh, pull up uh, to get the owner and find out what the owner owns. If he finds out I own 100 properties, he's certainly going to be much more inclined to come after me. But when he sees it's a trust and that it's the only thing in the name of that trust and no other property exists other than that particular property in the name of the trust, it's going to usually cost a retainer because he's got to drag me into court and get a judge to force me to even tell him who the actual owner is. On so top it, of that, it's probably a mortgage property too, so you have some protection through the mortgage property. Right, so it's a way of uh, giving you some protection. So if you'd like to learn more about trust and you'd like to find out uh, you know, when our, we're going to have another seminar about trust, make sure you put your name and email address in at addictedtorealestate.com. That is a place you're going to get this amazing information. And this is Addicted to Real Estate. We'll be right back. As a real estate agent, you know that most people buy a house once every seven years. Imagine working with clients that buy seven houses every year. At Addicted to Real Estate, they teach you how to work with investors because they are investors. Located in Montgomeryville, Hatboro, and Huntington Valley, they pay 90% commission. Work at an agency built for investors, buy investors, and finally learn how to invest yourself. Addicted to Real Estate Agency. Call them now, 215-321-SELL. 215-321-SELL. Hi, my name is Phil Falcone. I wrote a book called Addicted to Real Estate, Why I Can't Stop and Why You Should Start. And if you'd love to see an investment book written by a Philadelphian about investing in Philadelphia, I'm your man. You can check out my book at addictedtorealestate.com with the number two. I have a free web TV show there. I have free investment forms for real estate investors. And I have my book that you can check out, Addicted to Real Estate, Why I Can't Stop and Why You Should Start. And the website is Addicted to Real Estate with the number two dot com. I'm Phil Falcone from Executech Suites. Do you have a voicemail machine answering your business calls during the day? Oh, please tell me it's not true. I have an answering service for you that only costs $99 a month. We're real humans. That's right. We have live humans answering the phone in the name of your company and patching the calls to you for only $99 a month. And there are no contracts, so you can try it out anytime you like and cancel it whenever you like. Executech Suites, 215 942 701. I'm Phil Falcone from Executech Suites. I got a question for you. What do you get for $4.95 a month at Executech Suites? You get an office big enough for one person. You get the furniture in that office. You get the telephone on the desk. You get the telephone number. You get the fax number. You get the internet. You get two full-time receptionists to answer the phone in the name of your company and patch the calls to you, whether you're in the office, in your car, or at home sleeping on a couch. You get the conference rooms, you get the mailboxes, you get the printer, the copy, the scanner, you get the janitorial service, the utilities, and free coffee. I know it's hard to believe that you could get all those things for $495 a month, but it's true. 67 Buck Road in Huntington Valley, Executech Suites. Give us a call, 215-942-7701, 215-942-7701. Welcome back to Addicted to Real Estate Radio. I'm Larry Steinhaus, and I'm here with my buddies, Jeremy Ricci and Phil Falcone, and we're going to talk today about bridging the gap, bridging the gap between being an investor and being a real estate agent. You know, I, I, it's, again, it's one of my favorite topics because, you know, I started out as a real estate investor and then became a real estate agent. But there's so many people out there who are really who are investors and really want to become real estate agents or, or even vice versa. They're real estate agents who just don't know that they can make more money as as an investor. I mean, we said it last week, right, Phil? How much more, how much money do you make as a real estate agent versus how much money do you make as an investor? Yeah, I mean, that not that such a critical piece of information? I can assure you of this. I've had a real estate license for many years. I've been a real estate investor for 26 years. I can assure you without any question in my mind that while having a license is a wonderful way to earn money with real estate transactions, you will almost always earn more if you are the investor buying the property. And the only thing that's probably keeping you from doing that is the knowledge that we share with you. You just got to come and learn it. Yeah, and actually in our agency what we do is we actually teach uh, real estate agents 
how to become investors. We, you know, our agency is all about education. It's investor education and and real estate uh, real estate marketing education. You know, it's just awesome how how people you know come to our agency become investors. It just naturally happens. They 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 sit around us. They talk to us all day. They see us answering the phone and talking about deals and making deals. And it just it's just it's like osmosis. They just have to automatically become a, a real estate investor. And a lot of people bought got into bought the real estate license. I say got the real estate license. <laughs> um, <laughs> some some of them I think did Hopefully. buy it. <laughs> well, you know, they got to go through the test and everything. But um, a lot of people got their real estate license because they're interested in owning the real estate themselves and uh, not necessarily just taking on clients. But we see oftentimes people get so caught up in taking on clients that they neglect buying real estate for their own portfolio and, and building wealth that way. You know, you can definitely, like Phil said, earn a great income taking on clients, but the real wealth, I think, gets built in building up an asset base, and that asset base is uh, – real estate is a great asset base to build up. You know, I know we had uh, we had Stephen here a couple of weeks ago, and, you know, he, it's funny how, you know, he sits there and he's just in the office and he listens to you guys, and I watch it, and I, and I watch him become – you know, even the other day we had a whole discussion about how he's going to build a massive portfolio – uh, just because he watched you guys do it, or, or, or learning from you guys do it. So again, you know, you come to the office, you learn. You know, we also do. We also have, uh, you know, educational seminars where we're teaching people training seminars where we're teaching people marketing and how to market for real estate. And you know, and I, you know, just I, I don't know if uh, if there's real estate agents listening right now. You have probably heard of a product called Top Producer. Uh, I'm a pro- I'm a Top Producer certified consultant and trainer. And what's really nice about that is I use Top Producer not only for my real estate business. As an agency, but I use it as a real estate investor, and it just helps you keep on top of all of the pro- all the people that you want to talk to. It, it constantly sends marketing marketing material out to my potential sellers as well as my you know my potential sellers for real estate for, for real estate sales. I tell you, when you have something like let's say expired listings, real estate agents are constantly send, bombarding them with marketing, saying, "Hey, I know your house didn't sell with that agent. Try it again, but with me this time." Totally different message if you say your marketing, you know, putting your house on the market didn't work, but I'm interested in buying it. Let's talk and having that one-on-one conversation, talking to a seller and being able to buy their house and make an offer. Say, hey, listing your house didn't work. I'll list it again. You know, I think it's much more compelling to say, listing your house didn't work. How about I buy it? Yeah, actually, my favorite is expired rentals. That's good. So here's a here's a freebie for everyone out there. I actually target expired rentals when the when the when the rental expires. I sent him a letter saying, and it literally opens up and says, I noticed you had trouble renting your investment property. And then it goes on to say how I'd be interested in buying it. Yeah, would you consider selling it? It's vacant. What a great time to sell it. Absolutely. Right? And I know that they're already frustrated, especially most listings are, are 60 days. Uh, I'm sorry, are six months. So you can imagine if that place has been, re- has been vacant for six months, you can imagine how upset that landlord is right now. And a lot of real estate agents often use the as a complaint or, or, or they use an excuse to say, wow, you know what, timing just hasn't been right for me or, you know, I don't have the money to invest in real estate. And if you listen to us, listen to the show here, come out to our meetings, you'll find the creative acquisition strategies that a lot of the places won't teach you. Most the traditional method is put 20% down, you know, mm-hmm. go out and get a, a bank loan. And we have all sorts of different techniques that we use, including seller financing, uh, taking over other people's mortgages, which we haven't talked about on the show yet, but we will get into that at some point, and um, and using private money, and all those are, those are three, you know, great ways to buy real estate using none of your own money. And most real estate agents feel like there's something missing from the equation that they're not. They need to bring a bunch to the table in order to do right. that. And a lot of times, all you need to bring to the table is your creative thinking. Yeah, it's 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 funny that uh, a lot of people have the perception that if you're a realtor. Well, then you must have some amazing inside track on real estate investing. And I would say that that is not the case at all. What gives you the inside track on real estate investing is training from people who are real estate investors, full-time, preferably, real estate investors, experienced real estate investors, people who've been doing this for a long time and are addicted to real estate you know, if you put all of our uh, years of experience on top of one another, we probably have somewhere around 70 years of experience buying properties just between the three of us right here on the radio today. And an- another thing that's fascinating to me is so many real estate agents that I meet got their license and got into the business 
for the purpose of learning how to become investors. And, and then when they got into the business, they were immediately taught how to be an agent, not to be an investor, because nobody in that office really knew how to be an investor. And that's what makes us different at Addicted to Real Estate. When we say bridging the gap between investors and real estate agents, there is a, a really a lot of synergy between those two industries. And they should be put together and both done at the same time. There's no reason why you shouldn't be both. And yet it doesn't seem to be that way in the real world. People are either one or the other. And there's a, an incorrect perception out there by many real estate investors that there's some kind of conflict of having your license. And I'm here to assure you that there is not. And the same thing goes the other way. There's probably way more realtors who would love to be investors but have the, the, the false perceptions in their mind that Jeremy was talking about, that they don't have enough money or they don't have good credit or they don't have time or they're too busy, blah, blah, blah. The same amount of time it takes to get a client to give you a listing or to show 20 houses to a buyer, in the same amount of time you could be looking at 20 houses to buy. So it's, it's really something that we want to help people with. We want to make those perceptions evaporate, and we want to bridge the gap between investors and agents. You know, as a real estate investor, uh, I'm sorry, as a real estate agent, you know, when, I, when I'm talking to investors and, and trying to sell them houses, it's so much easier than it was when I was trying to sell, you know, a primary residence, for example. Because, again, you know, you're showing the primary residence, you're showing, you know, 5, 10, 15 houses before, they, before somebody goes, yeah, I kind of think this might be the one that I want. With, uh, with real estate investments, I show the numbers before I show any of the houses. So I take a piece of paper. This is how much it costs. This is how much you're going to make. This is the the, the most likely the, the cost of the utilities. This is a good one to go see. Let's put it on the list. And now I have a list of seven or ten properties. And the other thing is the investors aren't usually there to buy one property. They're there to build a portfolio. I mean, I've sold I've sold houses uh, where, with one investor in one day. I think the most amount was seven in one day to one investor, which was awesome. Then I've had people where I've taken two different investors who didn't know each other to go see five or seven properties in one day, and they were fighting over them. So you can imagine as a real estate agent struggling in the last few well, years. Let's back up. Physically fighting? No, no, no. no, no it was really, they were in the back of my car, and one guy goes, goes are you going to take that one? She goes, I'm thinking about it. And he goes, well, if you don't take it, I'm going to take it. And then she goes, well, I'm going to take it then. <laughs> So you can imagine, you, you know, you, you can imagine the difference between me as a real estate agent versus a real estate agent showing, you know, a couple a house that they're going to live in, and they're going to live there for the next seven years. So all that rapport building and everything you did to 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 earn that customer is useless for another seven years. Yeah, they may refer a friend or two, but so what? I'm taking a customer who's probably going to buy five to seven houses a year. And I build that rapport, and they just keep coming back to me. And, and here's the thing, and I hate saying this, but it really is true. If they don't like being a real estate investor after a year or two, well, guess what? They've now given me all those listings. So now I've so, I, I resell those properties. So it's a really good business to be in as a real estate agent dealing with investors. Well, how about, how about flippers, too? I mean, if you're a real estate agent sure. and, you, and you see the value of hanging your license in an agency that's investor-friendly, let's say you have a... Uh, Somebody that does fix and flip houses, they're going to buy, they're looking for houses to buy, so you could sell them a house, and, and then you can also turn around and put it on the market for them after it's all fixed up. So you get two transactions in a short period of time. We're talking a matter of months. You're getting paid twice on the same exact house. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I love that. So that's a neat thing. And, and you know, there's a lot of, um, it's really a niche that we have is, is a real estate investor-friendly agency. So if you're a real estate agent that, you know, always thought about investing in real estate yourself or wants to have an investor-friendly scenario where you're, you're dealing with, um, with, with guys in the office that all they do is real estate investing. Uh, you know, we're a place for you to consider. I think Addicted to Real Estate is pretty unique in our niche with uh, agents that want to be investors and investors that want to be agents. Yeah, and I want to say something that you said earlier, Phil. You, you had talked about um, where people, where, where real estate agents are, oh, I'm sorry, real estate investors are afraid to get their license because they think that it's a problem. In fact, the only difference is when you go to a contract of sale, you just have to disclose that you're a real estate agent. I am a licensed real estate agent in PA. That's it. That's all. That's the only difference between being a non-licensed and a licensed person. 
You know, it's funny you say that because uh, I had a meeting with a broker last week. Remember I told you I had a meeting with him? And he, he actually men- made a comment about that as well. And I said, well, uh, I've had this discussion with my broker, and my broker has told me to make sure I disclose. Other than that, problem solved, right? Yeah, and most brokers will, will have you just ask you to review the deal, even if it's a private deal that is not even going through the agency. Just let me look at the paperwork. You know, as a broker, just let me look at the paperwork just to, just for E&O purposes. But still, there's nothing wrong. Well, here's the other thing. I heard a lot of real estate investors say, well, geez, you know, if I get my real estate license, I'm going to be held to some higher standard. Well, and, you and are, I say, well, you're, but so what? As a professional, <laughs> But as a professional real estate investor, right. if all you do is buy houses – um, don't you think that's you're going to be held to that standard anyway? I mean, you're going to go in front of a judge, let's say, and 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 uh, they're going to say, "What do you do full time?" And you say, "Oh, well, I'm a real estate investor." Okay, well, I'm going to hold you to a higher standard. So whether right. you're an investor or an agent, you're still held to a higher standard. Right. And, and frankly, look, if you're if you're dealing ethically in your life, there's nothing problem here. I mean, that. if you're if you're a bad person, you're a bad person. It doesn't matter if you have a real estate license or not. You're just a bad person. I agree. It has nothing to do with the real estate license. It has to do with your character. Absolutely. And everything you do in life has to do with your character. Let me throw out a little invitation there. Um, I work out of the Hapro office. It's at the corner of Byberry in New York. And, you know, sometimes I'm sitting in that office by myself all day. I'm on the phone. I'm on my email. But it's an open office, and it's welcome to anybody. If you're in the area and you see my red beamer out front, come on in and talk to me. Let's talk. I love to talk to people about real estate deals. I love to talk to investors. I love realtors. I love agents. I'm addicted to real estate. So as long as you're willing to come in and talk about real estate, I'm welcome to talk to you. So if you're in the area, come by and see me. Uh, I'm Phil Falcone. My phone number is 267-988-2000. You can always give me a call. And if you're interested in becoming a sponsor or a guest on this show, that's another great reason to call me. If you're in a real estate-related industry, Let's talk. See if there's a way we can help each other out. Thanks for listening to Addicted to Real Estate Radio. This is Jeremy Ricci. Please listen to our show next week and every week, Thursdays at 3 p.m. on WWDB. That's Talk 860, WWDB AM. Addicted to Real Estate Radio. To say you gotta know.